I'm Martin and welcome to another great edition for Astronomy for Beginners and as you can remember from my last video guides I introduced a review on this great product called the Singuider 2. Now this basically is a standalone guider and in part one I showed you the features of this unique uh, camera which you use for auto guiding and on part two I showed you how it was set up and how you can use the controls on the Singuider. In part three I'm going to show you how this works in the field attached to my 50mm guide scope and with it it's piggybacked on my Skywatcher Equinox 66mm refractor and it is, it is supported onto my iOptron Smart EQ Pro mount. It has just a normal DSLR camera which is the Canon EOS 600D which is a very good camera a very basic camera but it does the job and with that camera alone uh, I managed to do a live setup uh, show you how this Singuider works in the field and you'd be quite surprised on how it performs now these weren't ideal conditions in fact uh, these were worse than from ideal conditions the skies were okay they were quite clear I had one slight problem is that it was very windy and it's not always ideal to uh, do astrophotography uh, especially when it's extremely windy I, I, I do I, I wanted it being a lot better but however main reason why I pick worse nights is that to push the limits of the Singuider now because it was windy I'm pushing the limits of this and you'd be quite surprised on how this performs okay wasn't brilliant it was windy but please please watch this video and see what you think so decided to clear up once for all and basically what we've got is we've got a telescope polar aligned and basically we've got Jupiter now ideally you should use a planet uh, or a bright star to begin with to set up your sin scan okay so as you can see here we've got the sin scan orientated and this is now focused and as you can see we just moved away from there so if we move our hand controller so we can get uh, Jupiter into view because Jupiter is a planet it basically drifts and as you can see there we've just got the Singuider just track the motion there of Jupiter right we've got Jupiter in, in view and basically what we're going to do is to go through the uh, the process it's in preview mode at the moment so basically what we do is if you press the press uh, if you press the the plus and minus button you can actually uh, increase the exposure now when you up the exposure limit what it does is it will brighten up whatever is there or star and all that but the main focus is we've focused on that image and Jupiter appears very bright so what we're going to do is we're going to move the telescope towards another st to a star now and we're going to guide we're going to set up the, the, the functions on there so now we've got uh, a star we just located and uh, as you can see it's around about magnitude 3 or 4 so it's quite bright and again using your plus and minus on your preview button okay if you go too low you might actually lose it and all that but at the moment we've got it there we, what we do is then is we press menu you can either center the star or you can zoom into the star but we don't really want to bother with that right and basically what you do is if you go on to the lock menu highlight lock press enter we're then going to click on auto you can actually manual lock it yourself but I can't see the point 
So we press enter. Okay, what it does is now grab the star, and as you can see, it's got a zoomed in variant of the star itself. Now that's locked on there. What you're going to do now is you're going to press menu. You then go into uh, guide, press enter again. It will give you the calibration to auto cal or resume. You press auto cal. And what it'll do is a series of steps, it will correct itself to find out what are the uh, tolerances and the movements of the star. And then compensate on any backlashes and stuff like that. And basically, now it's actually guiding. Now, as you're aware, is that the star appears to be too bright. You can actually lower uh, the exposure down as you're doing it. Okay, but you don't really want to do that. You just want to do it so the star is just bright enough. So around about 400 exposure time. Now, if you look at the PRI, the PRI is 28, 22. It's varying degree. Oh, it's a bit of a bad night, and uh, there's nothing I can do about that. But um, you want to get a value as high as high as 10. Anything lower than uh, 10 is not adequate as a um, as a guide star. So at the moment it's around about 22, 26, and that's what I'm looking for. Now you can adjust the um, the cross. Uh, you can adjust the settings if you're getting any trailing the images. You can adjust the decoration of the play. You press enter there and you can adjust the backlash. But we're not going to do that just yet. So we press uh, escape on that. And we're going to go into menu. And again, uh, noise. Level. Press enter. And noise is different because whatever exposure time you use it, uh, you need to level the amount of noise because you don't want to be fixing onto a hot pixel or something like that. But this is obviously a star. But when you adjust the noise, you end up losing a bit of the. Uh... So again, you adjust the setting so that the star appears bright. Uh, at the moment, I'm adjusting the brightness and I'm at level 7, so that's a good noise level. So press into that it seems to be overexposed but we seem to be getting there now now you can't see on screen but we've got the bright star on the screen at the moment and we're still guiding so what we're going to do is we're going to actually take a shot and the good thing is if you're guiding and it's a good guide you can actually disconnect the handset if you wish Okay, so you can disconnect it. So I've disconnected the handset and I'm still guiding. So we're at our image and we're going to set our camera. Now it's in uh, a live view at the moment. And we're going to take a shot. The mount's still tracking and the sing scan is still guiding so what we're going to do now is we're going to take that shot so now coming up to a minute and as we can see beautiful we're up to about a minute and we still haven't got any star trailing so again we're going to increase it to two minutes and you just keep doing that until you're happy don't forget is depending on your skies and all that you may get light pollution so if you up the exposure time maybe a little bit too much you start to whiten out the the area so again you get to a certain limit depending on your area if you've got good skies you can increase the exposure time and if you're lucky five to ten minutes is pretty good for a DSLR and as you see I'm still guiding so we're going to increase the exposure to two minutes 
We're not coming to two minutes. Okay, I missed that shot. And wow. That's uh, really impressive because if we look back on that image. Oh yeah. That is really good. What a difference that's made. I've got hardly any tracking errors on there. There's no star trailing and usually around about two minutes I start to get star trailing when it's unguided and already a massive improvement. It just shows that the sing guider on this really does work. So we're going to, uh, we're going to be really uh, adventurous and we're going to try five minutes this time. Five minutes exposures. Uh, that is really good. I'm really impressed with that. Okay, it's just a bright star we're taking a picture of, but at the end of the day, what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to get pinpoint stars. Now, if you do get in a bit of trailing, you can actually adjust the sing guider and adjust the, the backlash on the, on the detonation. But so far, that's not too bad. Uh, we're going to try again on another shot. So we're still locked onto that star. It's still guiding. At the moment, it's looking pretty good. We're now coming towards our five minutes and see what we, see what we get. We go up to five minutes. All right, we're starting to get a bit of drifting, but that's probably due to the fact we have a bit of wind. That can also play a lot of uh, dramas. If you look at that image there. As we can see now, we're starting to uh, wash out the image as well. So that is basically five minutes and we start to wash it out. Because the skies aren't that great and there's a bit of cloud will cover over as well, that, that can affect the images as well. And uh, a bit of light pollution as well. But as you can see there in that picture, it's pretty impressive that if I was going to take the pictures without the auto guider, I'll have massive star trailing. This is only slight, but I haven't got ideal conditions because it's, it's, it's a bit of a windy night for starters, so that will play a lot of havoc to the mount. Uh, so it's not ideal, but the whole point is that the auto guiding, just proof of that is I might need to adjust the declination axis. Uh, on the backlash, but there doesn't seem to be any backlash, but I think it's just more of a wind issue I think I've got there. But already, five minutes, that's pretty impressive. And uh, if I didn't have the auto guider, uh, basically uh, there would be a lot more star trailing than this. So the system on the sin guider really does work and it's still locking onto the stars. So fantastic device so what we're going to do is we're going to go on to uh, a deep sky object hopefully we can get one into view we'll stick we'll pick an easy one but we'll pick an uh, m45 and see what we get so we're still locked onto the star to unlock it we unlock it by clicking on menu on the handset and we go to scroll up to guide first we press enter to guide and then we're going to stop the guiding so press enter to stop the guiding once you're happy you go to menu and you go up to lock press enter and basically you highlight where it says unlock unlock the star so we now unlock the star and what we're going to do now is we're going to move the telescope so we now, what we've got a problem is um, we couldn't find a guide star. So what I've done is I've put the eyepiece in now and I'm going to look through it and then I'm going to use the mount to find a perfect star, guide star. So what we're going to do is we're going to look through. As you can see, it's tricky when I'm holding the camera at the same time as well. So I'm going to try and find a guide star.
Might slow that down a bit. Okay, so now I've got the a guide store in centre. I'm going to put the uh, the sim guider on. So now I've got the the sim guider back on, and we've now picked up a star, and we're now uh, capturing the image. So let's see what happens. So we've got the Sin Skyder and the telescope pointing at M45 Pleiades, which is a good ideal target for start off to auto guide. So I'm going to try and pick our guide star. Detected a star, what we're going to do now is click on lock, press enter, click on auto, enter. Okay, it's grabbing a star. So we've got a star that's grabbed. Click on menu, then we scroll down to guide. Press on guide, and then we press auto cal, press enter. It'll now do its calculations and motions of the star. So it'll do its uh, adjustments. It's checking north now, north positions. Seems to be doing a lot of corrections at the moment. As you can see, it's doing the corrections on the mount, you can just hear it. And now it's guiding. And now, now we're going to set up the camera. So we'll go out of our quick release, we've already got our settings. What we're going to do is uh, adjust the because uh, uh, ISO 800, okay. So exposed to a ISO 800, and then we're going to now do our exposure. So let's do the count now. So now we're doing the countdown and see what we get. Okay, not a very good shot. So now you watch the video. What do you reckon? Are you impressed on high performance? Now, okay, they're not ideal conditions. It wasn't perfect. My apologies if the video wasn't that great. But as you can see, uh, the scene guide worked really well, despite the conditions being quite uh, extreme. But it does show you that this product works. Now, I tried to get do some more recording but I ran out of film so I didn't have enough memory to record anymore. However, I did get the M45 Pleiades and I managed to sort out the tracking. All I had to do was align it to a better star and then restarted the procedure again. Luckily to my knowledge I managed to get 5 minutes exposure time which is quite impressive. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a single picture of M45, the Pleiades cl uh, open cluster and see what you reckon. So far I'm really impressed on how this camera has performed. This is 5 minutes exposure so this is just single 5 minutes exposure. There is a slight bit of star trailing but it's not it's not that bad and considering this was in the wind and the wind was against me on that night look at this picture see what you reckon so what do you reckon guys and girls are you impressed with the image 
I certainly was too. And I'm quite over the moon of what I've achieved with that result. But on that night, I actually got more images. So I managed actually to capture more images of uh, more deep sky objects in that night. And I managed to get the M51, which is the Whirlpool Galaxy. And uh, I also managed to get M13, which is the Gobbler Cluster in Hercules. So again, I've used different settings and different methods because obviously certain things when you take, capture deep sky objects is that really thin objects require more exposure time and M51 only requires between 2 to 5 minutes exposure to get some decent results and again I'll show you a single picture of that image on M13 because it's a very bright object in the night sky uh, you don't need a lot of exposure time and I managed to push uh, that to two minutes. Any much more than that, I'll end up washing out the image and I probably lose detail on the Gobbler Custer itself because I want it to remain the central stars in the, in the center core and try and get as much as I can without uh, uh, blowing out the center core. So the whole idea was to take low exposures on Gobbler Custers. But for really faint objects like the M51, for example, or anything that's really faint than that, then you require a lot more exposure times. So please, take a close look on these images and see what you reckon. So, you've seen the images, what do you reckon? Pretty impressive, eh? Which so it tells me now that Singida, despite a few flaws, okay, uh, my views on it, uh, the, the Singida performed really well. Despite the conditions weren't ideal, it just shows you there's a mass improvement on, on its sensitivity. And believe it or not, with this uh, sim guider working on a guide scope, particularly a finder guider like a 50mm finder scope being adapted, I was actually quite impressed that this actually managed to grab stars. Now don't get me wrong, because of the limiting aperture of a 50mm guide scope, you can take in so much light. Now as it states in the manual, it said that the Singida 2 works well with an 80mm refractor, which is true, but however, for people like myself or many others, don't have a high demanding EQ mount. And when, especially when you're mounting your imaging rig, uh, certain mounts can only take so, so much payload. And the ideal factor is if you want a perfect running uh, imaging setup you want your mount to have a payload of 70% of the maximum payload it can ca carry so in other words uh, for example if I had a mount for example like the EQ5 mount has a payload of 10 kilograms now I do not want to put my complete setup my camera my guide scope my guide camera my main camera up to the maximum and it's not ideal to push it to the maximum weight. So you're, what you're looking at is between 7%. In other words, 7 kilograms is, is the maximum you can push on an EQ5 mount. So, and that's the main reason why um, uh, astronomers don't push the payload. Because if you push the payload to the max, you end up putting a lot more strain on the, uh, the motors, you're going to get all sorts of balance problems and all kinds of things. Also, when you increase the weight, you're also making it more sensitive for more vibrations, particularly in the wind concerned. Now, don't get me wrong, my setup alone is almost to the limit of my iOptron Smart EQ mount, which I totally agree, it is up to the max, and it is. 
but considering I'm doing two minutes and five minutes exposure using this Sin Guided 2 it's pretty impressive and very impressive considering it, I was against the wind so it just shows that again a decent mount does pay off and the I Ultra mount for example is a very good mount and I'm quite impressed on what I've achieved so far with this awesome product I'm really impressed with this guy camera because it's standalone they tend to get a little bit of bad press uh, with this camera and to be honest with you the only bad flaws I do don't I don't like about this camera is one the screen is too small for some strange reason Skywatcher have still not developed a bigger screen for you to, to see it and ideally a screen that you can also pivot like a typical DSLR camera on certain models is that you can flip the screen so you can tilt it at different angles so you can view it and see how the guide star is coping another thing that I like to see is um, I like to see the, the dimness so you can adjust the brightness now the brightness is just right on this camera but however on certain light uh, uh, conditions you may want to dim the light even more or brighten it up so I love to have seen a feature for that which there isn't one another uh, thing I would like to see on this camera is I like to see if there's a warning audible uh, alarm in other words if you lost the guide star and this sin guider fails to track at least there will be some audible alarm to let you know that it's lost the star now this is not at fault of the camera itself it just means that it could be a cloud that's moved across the sky and it happened to just uh, go over the bright star that you're trying to guide with and basically it loses it it loses the lock and so I, and again the only identifying features on there is star lost you see it on screen on this tiny screen I would like to have seen it to say look okay star lost beep 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 a simple like an audible beep would do you know just to give you a hint that the guide star is lost however the good thing about this guide camera is it's quite light I like how you can adapt it to fit uh, certain formats to 2 inch to inch and a quarter and I do like how there's an IR uh, or UV filter built in now so and again the handset is much more easy to use when they first brought out this, uh, the actual handset were very difficult to press the buttons and sometimes stuck, stick these ones are a lot more durable, they're a lot more sensitive and they're easy to operate I do like how you can uh, disconnect the handset on there and the guide camera still works on the old one particular it didn't work very well with the handset being disconnected however with this one you can disconnect the handset uh, put it to one side and let the guide camera do the work another good thing about this Singaida 2 is that the actual layout is a lot more easier there is no messing about with the X, Y uh, orientation alright with this you just align it to the crosshair as I've shown you on part 2 how to orientate the camera and that's all you need to do on the old scene guider you had to sort out uh, x and y positions on where uh, where the star is going to turn and there was different uh, extra menus for you to select it for it to work properly however there's none of that you just plug it in there look onto the star and then start your calibration process once it's done that's it you're off and away this is a lot more quicker than the scene guider one so Singider 2 has remarkable features on there, very easy to use and I'm actually quite impressed. Despite being the old type of body, it doesn't really matter. It performs really well and the thing is it works quite reliable. Now with the 50mm guide scope, it does have its limitations and because of the, the certain the aperture of the light can be collected 
you can collect the, enough light if the sky conditions are great it can you can lock on to bright guide stars of magnitude three to four which is okay but that's all you need and with a 50 millimeter guide scope I, be, I was able to track with the sin guider quite well and with about 600 milliseconds I could still see the stars of magnitude 3 and 4 with this sin guider so it just shows you uh, that this works with a 50 millimeter guide scope so I wanted to demonstrate the sin guider using a 50 millimeter guide scope which I recommend to beginners to use a guide scope auto guiding method it is the easiest one to use and you do not need uh, an extensive amount of equipment to, for a guiding system to work and that's why I use the 50mm guide scope now believe it or not you can guide anything with a 50mm guide scope unless it, the, the telescope you are imaging with which works out depending on the F ratio uh, 1500 millimeters it's quite a lot of it it's quite a lot of focal length so anything at 1500 millimeters or below you can actually guide with a 50 millimeter guide scope quite effectively but again it just deter it just determines on the skies now if you've got good clear dark skies then it's perfect uh, so it does have its limitations these standalone guiders you've got to have good skies and uh, and again a lot of auto guiders and guide cameras will work on certain conditions but again they also get effective by some means now the reason why I use the 50mm guide scope is because it's very easy to use for beginners to start off guiding because auto guiding can consist of even more complex uh, uh, procedures, uh, more equipment uh, required. With all that complex equipment, when you go deep into auto guiding, the price mounts up. And believe it or not, you can spend thousands of pounds on just the guide system alone, which you don't need to. You do not need to spend a lot of money just have just to have auto guiding set up and again this setup here with a standalone guider on a basic EQ mount which is adequate for auto guiding but the main key aspect is if you're going to use if you're going to use any mount for guiding make sure you check the mount to see if it has an ST4 port lead if there's a port on that mount you can auto guide and then you can start investing in one of these sim guider twos or any other guide camera okay so before you do any uh, means of auto guiding please check your mount please check that the mount has the st4 port if it doesn't you can't auto guide so you're restricted you can only do so much on that mount but like your ioptron mounts and a lot of your skywatcher mounts and celestial mounts again check the specifications of your mount to see if it has the st4 port lead and then you can do auto guiding so that is my top tip before you start investing on guide cameras and guide scopes check the mount first but the good thing about this setup, if you've got good sky conditions and you've got this setup, you can guide to 10 minutes, 15, 20, 25, 30 minutes, and even to an hour if you're lucky. But the one crucial aspect is your pole alignment must be precise. And if it's accurate and your telescope is not overloaded and you've got your balance correct, and you've got ideal conditions like the sky is clear and less turbulent and it's not windy for example if you've got good conditions and this is set up right you're on for a winner and you can get some amazing results and again 
if you've got light pollution this determines on how much you can expose now as you can see on my last on that video as soon as I went past five and, and, and beyond it started to wash out the image so again you've got to be careful when you push the limits of your setup and again we all love to have 10 minutes and 15 and whatever exposures but when you start pushing the limits you will start to lose uh, the detail you start to wash out the details so again you go to a certain factor so when you start exposing an image as soon as you start to get any washout or starts to uh, brighten up stop to that amount because that's where your sky conditions is limiting on, what, on how much you can expose and again you can fit uh, a, a nebula filter to try and enhance and increase your exposure times and again a good CLS filter for example will enable you to expose a lot longer but again as you push the limits uh, it'll start to wash out so that's something to bear in mind the other thing is, as I mentioned about the mount, with a sim guider, for example, again, don't overload the mount. Try and keep it between the 70% of the payload. Once you keep it within that, you should have a decent tracking mount and you'll be able to guide effectively. And again, a camera like this cost me £210. It doesn't cost a lot of money. Combine that with a guide scope, you and as long as it has the mount has an ST4 port, you can auto guide with your setup. And again, I always recommend beginners to use the the guide scope method. And as you can see, I reached two to five minutes on less than ideal conditions, and this thing guide re worked really well. So then, it just shows that this standalone guider works a treat and to my final words to this product to this awesome product despite all the limitations despite all the slight flaws in it would I recommend this camera yes I would and for one reason only is that because it's a standalone and it has that standalone feature I would definitely recommend to beginners to invest in one of these and particularly if you've got a portable setup this is ideal because with portable setups you don't need much power you just need the power power to the camera and your mount and with this you need some power with an external battery and you can go out get your camera your telescope and your guide cam set up and you can start auto guiding quite quickly because there's no need to set up a computer and then set up your guides camera you know and then you need a lot of batteries you need batteries to power up your computer and then it can be a bit of an asshole for some people and with this thing guided it works really well and I seriously recommend uh, to beginners if you want that kind of setup of a, an ultra portable setup for a particular with no need for a computer then this would be an ideal product for you and again, see what you think, I'm impressed with what I've seen so far. I wish that Skywatcher would do uh, some more developments on the actual screen itself and, and certain aspects to this camera. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. So please subscribe onto my channel. We're also available on Astronomy for Beginners uh, Facebook group. So if you are interested and you want to find out more information about astronomy, please join that group. Uh, and again, if you're interested in purchasing the Sin Guider 2, you can buy this at good astro retailers, Tring Astronomy, Alto Astro, Telescope Service and Rover Valley Optics. You can get this at a decent price of this camera. So thanks for watching. Look forward to another video guide and I wish you all clear skies.